sing, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. may be seated. Uh, one thing I'm just happy to announce is we're doing something new today for the first time. We are, uh, we are live on the internet right now. Uh, we uh, have worked on this for some time and Greg's been working on the, the details with, uh, with uh, Tracy and, and uh, Kevin and, and uh, we've, uh, we've had an archive now of services videoed, as scary as that may be. Uh, an archive of that on our website. If you go to Video Library, you'll find the last several weeks. But we've contracted with a company to archive that for us and to help us live stream that. So uh, that does not give you permission to stay at home. However, if you do and you have internet uh, service, uh, you, can, you can do that. They do not pass the offering plate at your home. So if you are at home, uh, don't forget us. Uh, here, so we're pleased to to be doing that. I I want to take a a moment to um, to say thank you. Um, October was a blessed month uh, in many different ways. You showed appreciation uh, toward your pastor and his family, and and um, I am grateful for that. For one, I'm grateful to be your pastor. Period. And you're not shy on appreciation throughout the year in many different ways, and I am appreciative of that. Um, we were at the tailgate a couple of weeks ago, and Larry Arrington walked up to me. I was in the middle of a conversation. And he walked up to me and said, I got a presentation to make, handed me an envelope, and did something that um, don't happen to me very much. He left me speechless. I didn't know what to say. Uh, you are a gracious, uh, generous people, and uh, love you dearly, not just for envelopes. I'll tell you what I love about you. I love you because you love my family. I love you because you take care of my kids. And, and uh, it don't take a village. It takes a church. Amen? And uh, you help with that. And you're a, an encouragement to my wife, an encouragement to me. Uh, I'm appreciative. It is truly a joy to be your pastor. On Tuesday, we'll celebrate Veterans Day as a nation. My father served in the Air Force for 20 years and retired when I was young, I am forever grateful for those who served in our military, for it was because of your service and so many like you before that allow us the freedom that we have in this country to do what we do right now. It is because of your service that uh, there are other parts of the world that have that privilege as well. And I'm thankful for those who've served our country. Jesus said it best, of course. When he said in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than he laid on his life for his friends. And as I heard recently, if you served this country, you laid down your life. Even if you didn't have to give your life in death, you gave your life in life. And we as a country are appreciative. If you're a veteran and you've served our country in some capacity in that, if you would stand, please. We appreciate all that you've done for us. There will be a Veterans Day service at 930 at the high school on Tuesday. If you're a veteran and would like to be a part of that, you're asked to be there at 9 o'clock. I encourage you to support our veterans. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father. Greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. I'm thankful for the examples that you've set before us to show us how one ought to serve others, oh God. I'm thankful for our veterans. Lord, I know the one, too, that really laid down his life for us. 
we come to celebrate Christ today. We come to celebrate Christ because you laid down your life, lived a sinless life, died a sinner's death, oh God, on our behalf, and rose again to prepare for us a place and to make intercession for us at the right hand of the Father. We are forever grateful for that. We're grateful, oh God, for the fellowship of believers as we have in this place today. It is an encouragement to us to be able to come together, and Christ established all of that. We are thankful for the freedom that you've allowed this country, and I pray, oh God, that in our stupidity, we don't mess up the freedom that we have. Lord, help us to do everything we can to preserve the freedom in our land, oh God, to worship you. Help us to respond appropriately when people try to take that freedom away, oh God. And Lord, guide us today. Give us instruction today, personal instruction, for our own lives, for our own homes, for our own jobs. Oh, dear God, give us guidance in how to not only survive in this mixed up, corrupt world, but, oh God, to thrive in Christ. I pray, Lord, that you'll give us uh, encouragement today through singing. Lord, that you'll give us wisdom through prayer. Oh, God, that you'll give us knowledge through your word, Father. And a fervor, an intangible fervor, oh, God, to live for you and to serve you in all of our lives. Guide us today as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue our worship as we sing, Here I Am to Worship. Please stand. We, we are so blessed to have Casey Lancaster playing the guitar for us this morning. And um, this, this song has marked my life, and I'm thankful for it. And I pray y'all can worship as we sing it. And Casey probably wasn't nervous until Brother Daniel told him he was on live stream. <clears throat>
Thank you, ladies. And Casey, if you'll just stay and play behind me while I preach, that'd be, that'd be wonderful. It's great. Thank you so much. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, our, our world is full of battles and wars. I don't watch the national news much, but if you do, you'll see. All kinds of terrorist attacks and bombs going off and shoulder-launched missiles. You'll see a, a war-torn world in which we live. But the greatest battle that is in our world today is the battle within. The biggest war that you have to fight is not against somebody else. The biggest war that you have to fight is not against somebody else. It's within. Because the evil one wants to defeat you. He'll use people around you. He'll use your own psyche. He'll work on your heart. He'll make you think that the conflict is outside of that that the real heart of it is in somebody else or in another matter or on the job or whatever. But the reality is the greatest battle. As a matter of fact, the wars you see on the news are simply the evidence of greater battles within because we got to get it out somehow. And somehow we'll deal with it in the wrong way if we don't win the battle. Now we've been talking about this war within for some time and we began to look at, at the Apostle Paul's description of how to stand in the midst of a battle like that. He says in the same way that the Roman soldier would be armored up, we have to be armored up as well. We have to have our equipment on in order for us to to win in this battle. The reality is if you strive to come to God, if you strive to live for God, if you strive to stand for God, the devil's going to try to hurt you in the process. He's going to try to take your fervor, your excitement, your energy for that. He's going to try to take it away. And he's not like a bully that just bugs you, you know. 
I was in school, a little guy, I'd sometimes have, I ain't always been a big guy, and, and I, I, I'd have some guy flick me on the back of the ear or whatever. I had a lot of ear infections, so I didn't like that, and I'd bust him up. No, not really, but it makes for good testimony anyway. But, you know, those bullies, just, just bugging you, those people that just, just bug you. Thank God there's nobody like that in the world today, amen? That's not what the devil is. He wants to ruin you. He wants to ruin you. He wants to ruin the people around you, too. He actually wants to ruin people around you through you, if he can. (laughs) To use you as a catalyst in his battle. And if he can wage enough war in, in us, then he can cause us to act different toward other folks. And he can make us, or lead us, not make us, lead us to make Dumb decisions. Not only decisions that are not smart, but I'm talking about life-changing, stupid decisions. I'm sorry, but that's what they are. He wants to do that. He wants to lead us. He wants to cause us to act differently toward other folks. You may not be as sweet as you should be. If you think you are, you ask your neighbor, and they'll tell you. He'll cause you to act different before the Lord. When you're war-torn, it's hard to be excited, joyful when you're hurting. And so he'll cause you to not want to walk as faithful with the Lord when you let him have a foothold. When you let him play out his strategy. Now that is his strategy. He wants you to fail. And the key part of that for the evil one is to keep you out of a relationship with God. He don't want you to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus. If he can convince you never to give up your way and surrender your life to his way, if he can convince you of that, he's got your soul both now and for eternity. And so we always encourage folks as much as we possibly can. I can't make a decision for you. But we constantly encourage folks to give their heart and life to Christ. And it's not just a a religious procedure. It's a life commitment, a, a decision to surrender your own way for his way and to let him have his rule and reign in your life. And if you look around at us to see how that ought to be done, don't do that. Don't do that. We won't get it right. He's better than we are. Okay. We are imperfect at it, and you will be too. But the reality is you need to be in a right relationship with God. You need to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do that, His Holy Spirit will empower your life and change you, and not only for eternity, in your eternal destination, but really... For the day, just as importantly, he will change you now. Christ said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And that is what salvation can give us. And the devil don't want us to have that. So he'll fight for us not to have that. If we surrender our life to the Lord and give our heart and life to Christ, then he'll cause war within us then too. You know why? Because he don't want anybody else coming to Christ. He don't want our influence to influence anybody else. He don't want us to enjoy our walk with Christ. He don't want us to walk right with the Lord. Because when we don't walk right with the Lord, we miss a lot of the blessings of the Christian life. He wants us to fail at trying to live out our life for the Lord. And so if you are a Christian, he don't want you satisfied. He wants to try to convince you to itch for for something something else or or to to cause enough distress in your life that that you don't focus upon your relationship with the Lord. If you don't know the Lord personally, he don't want you to. And I promise you he'll work hard at that. He will customize his strategy to your mindset and try to convince you not 
to do it. He don't want those around you to know Christ either, personally. And so he, he'll misguide us. He'll, he'll keep us from sharing the faith that is within our heart with our tongue. He'll keep us from telling other people about it. He'll, he'll keep us from, try to keep us from living out our life before others as well. He'll try to keep us from sharing. He'll try to make us do stupid things in front of people or dumb decisions in front of people to somehow make a bad witness to them so they don't want to hear what we have to say. I mean, who's to give spiritual advice if every time they see you, you're unhappy? They don't want to, they don't care what you what your formula is in life, because something ain't working. So the devil tries to get us not to be happy and tries to get us to act different, to make us an accessory to the lostness of the people around us. And he does that through what the Bible calls flaming, fiery darts. And the Bible tells us that that attack is coming, and it tells us how to combat that attack. Now, I want to focus this morning more on the attack. I've got in this iPad not only the attack, but how to stand up under the attack, but we'll be here so long you won't care. And I realized that sometime yesterday. And so... (laughs) I'm just going to tell you about the attack if you promise to be back next week. If you ain't coming back next week, you got to stay, and I'll finish it out. <laughs> Ephesians 6, verse 16 says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming dark of the evil one. Let's pray together. (coughs) Heavenly Father, I pray today that you will help us to to understand the battle we're in. To understand that we're not the only ones in it. To understand that those around us are in it as well, dear God. And to help us to stand strong in the midst of it, Father. I pray that you'll lead us today. Through your word, in Jesus' name, amen. we got to defend ourselves from these flaming darts. And the Apostle Paul tells us to do that by the power of God through a shield of faith. Now, first I want to tell you about this shield that we're talking about and how it is a strategic protection during battles. Now, when Paul talks about the armor of God, what he's got on his mind was what he saw in his day, and that was the Roman soldier. They were the best protected, and he knew them because he's chained to them in prison. And so he knew them, not that they had all that garb on when they were sitting in a prison cell chained to a prisoner, but he was well aware of the power of the Roman Empire, and he was ushered by these soldiers time to time from court or from assembly and where he shared. The book of Acts tells us that. So he was well aware of them, and he thought of the imagery of that protection when he thought about our protection in the midst of, of the battle. Now, the shield that they have, it is no Captain America shield now, okay? I mean, it's not. That's not what it is. It, it is not a, a round trash can lid size shield. That is... That is not at all what it is. These shields were instead the size of a small door. As a matter of fact, these shields were about two and a half feet wide and about four feet long. If you've seen policemen, SWAT teams uh, in riot gear, and you've seen them go down the the street with those shields in in front of them. That was much like the shield that that they had. The shield that they had was made of wood 
and, and iron, and, and it was often layered with a, with a coat of linen, linen. And then after that, there was leather. And, and when they would go into battle, they would dip that shield in water. And the reason they dipped that shield in water is because many times the enemy would use, would, would use arrows, darts, as they called them. They would use them, they would dip the end of them in tar, and they would light that dart and shoot it. Now, if they shot it in the midst of a, of a hay field, it'd cause a fire and it'd cause all kinds of problems for the enemy, you know? So they were trying to, to and if you had a flaming arrow go through you, it'd be a life changer. And so, so, so they were trying to, to, to do that and, and, and trying to, to cause that. And so these shields were made much the same size as the dude on the screen. These shields were, were made to, to stop that. As a matter of fact, historians tell us about one fellow that came in from a battle with over 200 arrows through his shield. Can you imagine? Uh, they relied upon them. And when an army was pursuing another army in battle, these soldiers would line up and they would use those shields uh, not only as a protective wall around them, but the guys in the middle would put it over their head and they would form what they called a phalanx. And a phalanx was this, this formation of protection, this wall. These shields, some of them were made with hooks in the side of them for this very purpose, to, to hook it together, to allow them to hook together and make one wall of defense. That's the kind of protection that we need against the fiery darts of the evil one. Not only do we need a shield of faith, we need to be able to hook on to somebody else along the way. Amen? I mean, that's why we're here, folks, is to hook on to somebody else along the way and to be able to have protection in the midst of a battle in which we face. Now, now what kind of fiery darts does the evil one throw at us? Well, I'm glad you asked because he has a tendency to throw several different types. The, the first one that, that I want to talk about is a dart of misdirection. He loves to shoot the darts of misdirection at us. I mean, that is what temptation is, by the way. The goal of temptation is to misdirect you, to, to direct you the wrong way. So, so the devil will lobby his attempts at, at throwing you off. First John 2.16 puts it this way. It says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. Now, when 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says that, it's also sometimes translated as the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And, and when he talks about the lust of the flesh, one of these these misdirected darts that the devil throws at us. When he talks about the lust of the flesh, he's talking about the physical cravings that fill our mind. I mean, God made us with an appetite. He made us with an appetite for food. He made us with an appetite for drink. He made us with an appetite for sensuality. And the devil loves to exploit us on those matters. He loves to make our, that appetite feel like an absolute need, and he loves to distort the way that we fulfill that. He'll do that by causing us to eat too much. He'll do that by causing us to drink too much. He'll do that by causing us to think about sensual things too much. The devil loves to, to lead us to any and all of those things and let them be our focus. He loves to lead us to disobey God's standards. He does that today through pornography. He loves to misguide people in the privacy of their own minds through the images that he puts before them, through the things that they see and are thrown off by. He loves to do that through fornication called hooking up today, but it's still fornication. It's still wrong. 
And that's when two people who are not married get together and do wrong things that only married people ought to do. He loves to misguide us in that. Loves to get us fixated on those things. Loves to get us convinced it's okay. And he'll do all kinds of things to try to convince us of that. But the reality is, folks, God's standard has not changed. You say the standards of our world's changed. Well, the standards of America may have changed. The Roman Empire was just as corrupt as modern-day America. I can promise you that. And we can decide if we want to whether we're going to live like the world or we can decide if we're going to live by God's standards. But God's standards had not changed. He loves to lead us into immorality. He loves to lead married people into immorality because it destroys families. And the devil loves to destroy his families. He loves to do that. He loves to do it in people who are not married to make them act like they are married because it causes such a tangle emotionally and psychologically and physically in them that it causes our society to be disrupted. I mean, think about it. Think about what immorality has done to America. Think about how much it's cost America. I mean, in so many different ways, in every way that you can count, how much has cost America, how much we're hurt by it, and yet how, what's, how easy it is for us to try to justify it. He loves to keep it ever-present in our mind. When the TV came out, people got TVs in their homes. It was Ozzie and Harriet and Leave it to Beaver, and Mr. Ed was the most scandalous show on television. A horse can't talk. That's not in God's order. Man, the three stooges, the stuff they'd get into, they thought that was violent. You know, the little rascals, can kids really be that evil? And now... I would say football is the best thing on television, but I know what it does to you people. That's a whole other sermon for a different day, unless I run a rabbit. I'd undone it one time this morning, and I mean, the reality is he fills us full of all kinds of junk, and, and he lowers our standard, tries to lower our standard. He don't get the credit for it. We choose to do it. He tries to lower our standard. Well, we don't even recognize it anymore. We don't even see it anymore. The world is filled with inappropriate action, and it seems justified, and God's standard has not changed. That's the lust of the flesh. Then there's the lust of the eyes. That's materialism that that so much fills our mind full of. It's that deep desire that we have to want more, to want something else. We got to get something new. And when we get something new and the luster wears off of it, then it's time to get something else. May not have to replace that that lost its luster, but but let's look at something else. Let's try to find something else. Let's, Let's get something else. We need something more. Somebody got something better than us. We got to get a little bit better than them. I always say we try to keep up with the Jones and then the Jones refinance, you know. And the problem, there's so many problems with that because we're trying to feed our appetite with something beside the Lord and it's not going to work. It's never going to satisfy. He's made us for himself. It's never going to satisfy. But the problem is that we get so deep in debt these days. We get so deep in debt these days that we can't give to the Lord faithfully. We struggle to give God what his portion is. We struggle to walk through the doors of opportunity that God puts before us. When sometimes God will put a check in my spirit about somebody that I need to do something for that person. If I'm so strapped like so many folks are that I can't even give to somebody else when opportunity comes. The devil loves that. Because he restricts our witness because of our appetite. We got to get something else. We got to get something more. We like what we have until we see somebody else give something else, and so we don't like what we have anymore. We have to come under the discipline of the Lord with our materialism. 
We have to give the reign of our stuff to him. It's his stuff. Would he buy it? That's a scary thought, ain't it? Let me tell you something. Faithful tithing will rule out a lot of what you don't need. If you make that a priority in your life and give God all of your check, I'm not saying give it all to the church. I'm saying give it all to God. Understand that everything you've got is his. And everything that you've got has been given to you by God, has been entrusted to you by God. And what he asks for, commands, is that we give 10% of that to him. When we understand the principle that everything we have, we're stewards of his, and that we are already responsible for giving 10% to him. When we get that in our minds and live that principle out, it changes our perspective on a lot of other things. It helps us put everything else in order. Do we get it right? No, no, no. I didn't say that. Not all the time. But it, it sure does help us have a head start on making wiser decisions if we prioritize our faithfulness to the Lord. The devil knows that. The devil knows that. So he works hard to overextend our pocketbooks by overwhelming the lust of our eyes. By overwhelming us and always wanting something else. Always wanting something a little better, a little newer, a little fresher. That, that's, the, that's the devil at work is what that is. We'll never be satisfied, by the way, because everything we get is going to get old right after we get it. So we'll never be satisfied if we're looking at the things of the world to satisfy us. We'll just want more. And then there's the pride of life. He wants you to think that you are what is most important about your life. Uh, he wants you to be believe that, that you are the cat's meow. You are the center of the universe. He tries his best to convince us of those things. And if you listen to him, he'll convince you of that at your expense. He'll convince you that you're a little better than everybody else and if you are convinced of that you'll feel hateful towards somebody else trying to succeed because you want to stay a little bit above everybody else i mean i mean if you think you're a little bit better than everybody else you'll be hateful toward your rivals and not only that you'll have too many rivals and it all comes back to darts of misdirection he loves to misdirect us get us thinking about stuff we don't need to be thinking about Focused on stuff we don't need to focus on. But then there's also the darts of, of misfortune. It's the darts of misfortune. You know, life is rough. It is. We're born in a, in a fallen world, and, and because of that, your body is going to get sick. And one day it's going to wear out, and, and it's probably going to hurt along the way. And we face that at different degrees in different ways. But we face those difficulties. And that is hard enough in itself. But then if you get the devil mixed in with that mess. When somebody gets so down that he can't look up. And he takes his life. And we're blown away by that and don't understand that. What in the world? What in the world is that? It's the devil. It's the devil. When, when somebody uh, when somebody gets uh, faces a, a, a health trial or a relationship trial, and and they walk away from their relationship with God because they're so overwhelmed by their difficulty, what would cause somebody to do that? The devil. He loves to isolate us. 
And if he can isolate us and get us alone in our own mind that nobody else understands us, nobody else has ever been through this, I'm different than everybody else and nobody understands, nobody even cares, nobody's even there. If he can convince us and isolate us in such that way, oh, my friend, he'll drive you mad if he can. He'll try his best to. Why does somebody seemingly out of the blue in their own life without any regard for the devastation that they leave behind. It's the evil one. Why does somebody choose to walk into school instead of taking their own life, take all kinds of innocent lives with them, or go back to their workplace and get mad at somebody else and do all that just to end their own life? Why do they do that? That ain't nothing but a terrorist attack of the devil is what that is. He loves to... To, to jump on us. He's a liar and he's the, he's the father of lies. And so he loves to jump on us. He loves to jump on, on us in times of misfortune or when we're down. He loves that. But he is a liar. And so therefore he also throws darts of, of mistruths. Darts of mistruths. John 8, 8 verse 44 says he's a liar and the father of lies. He'll tell you that you're worth nothing. He'll tell you that no one loves you. Jesus died to make you one of his. If you are in Christ, don't listen to a liar. You're a king's kid. You have royal rich blood running in your veins. You're a plutocrat. Don't you listen to the deceiver. Don't you do it. He'll criticize you. He'll call you a hypocrite. He'll tell you that you ought to give up. Don't you do it. You walk with God. Ask for forgiveness, and in the power of the blood of the Lamb, walk away from garbage he throws in front of you. Don't be naive about it. Don't be slow about it. Don't be pondering about it. The devil is a, a liar. He will tell you that no one will know. He's lying. He will tell you that one time is okay. He's lying. He'll tell you that it won't cost you anything. He's lying. He'll tell you that you cannot change. He's lying. He's a liar. And he loves to throw darts of mistruths. Not only that, but he also throws darts of mixed motivations, mixed motives. Why go all the way with God? Why go all the way for God when you can go halfway? <laughs> That's the devil. Don't make the priorities of God the priorities of your life. Do instead what you want to. That's, that's the devil. Don't be faithful to the people of God. Don't be faithful to the house of God. Neglect the fellowship of believers. That's the devil. You're too busy. That's the devil. Don't go back to that church. you got a problem with somebody there. That's the devil. You don't have good enough clothes. That's the devil. You don't know where you're going to sit. That's the devil. Oh, he'll work. He'll work to convince you of something. He'll work to make you angry, too. He'll make you angry at everyone he can. And when somebody does you wrong and you fail to forgive them, that's the devil's influence in your life. When you have bitter feelings towards somebody and you refuse to speak to them, that's the devil working in you. When you get so caught up in television or you get so caught up in politics or you get so caught up in ball games or you get so caught up in Facebook that everybody else's business causes you to neglect God's business and to neglect the Word of God, that is the evil one. Why does my mind wander to the worries of the day when I pray? That's the evil one. Trying to detain me. Trying to distract me. Why does my morning fill up and the word of God get pinched out of my life? It's the evil one. Why do opportunities for fun come on Sunday and pinch us out of church? That's the evil one. It's all strategic 
I ask myself so often, I ask God so often, what's the spiritual status of the two-thirds of folks that say they belong to First Baptist Church but do not darken the doors in the seven years I've been here? What is their spiritual status, Lord? Are they just saved and cold before the Lord? Are they saved and lukewarm before the Lord? Or do they even know the Lord? What in the world's going on? It's the evil one. He loves to lob fiery darts of mixed motives at our lives. And how do we fight that? How do we stand against darts of misdirection? How do we stand against misfortune? How do we stand against the darts of mistruth? How do we stand against the darts of mixed motives? You do it with the shield of faith. You do it with a shield of faith. Now, I want you to know what that protective shield is. And I'll simply tell you today that it's faith. Paul defines it as a shield of faith. That it is faith that protects you from the fiery darts of the evil one. What is faith? Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Simply put, faith is believing and applying what you believe. Now, you promised me before I ever got started that if I told you about the darts of misdirection and misfortune and mistruths and mixed mixed motives, that you'd come back next Sunday and hear what makes up that shield of faith, right? Or did I just wish that? Let me just say this. You've heard the Holy Spirit speak to your life today. It may have been when we talked about misdirection, misguided. It may have been when we talked about misfortune, difficulties that you faced and it's done you the wrong way. It may have been when we talked about mistruths and how he lies to us, and we've listened to some of those lies. All of us have. It may be the mixed motives. We just get mixed up and get our priorities out of whack. I I don't know what it is, but I'll tell you, you cannot win this battle alone. You cannot do it. God didn't make you a lone ranger. He, one, gave you the power of the Holy Spirit of God through a relationship with him to stand strong through faith. And that shield of faith that he gave you has a hook on the side. And you know what that hook is for? To hook on to somebody else. To hook on. We don't need to be a depleting, hurting, bloody people. We need to be an army of warriors for God. Strapping together to fight the battle. Quit faking it. We're fighting it, folks. Every one of us are facing it. If you don't think you are, you're losing the battle. Every one of us are facing it. Can we just be honest with each other and with God? We got stuff. We got battles. And sometimes we do well with it. And sometimes we don't do well with it. And we need one another. And we need the power of God in our lives. So let's don't point fingers at who's doing bad and who's doing good. Let's just realize that we all got stuff going on and we all need God in our lives and God's people in our lives. And let's commit our hearts to live for him, trusting in what we don't see, but knowing that it's there, the hand of God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're not a child of God, if you've never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus, today's your opportunity to do that. Now, My hope and prayer is that you will. Maybe you're here and you have done that, and you know God's leading you to be a part of this church. We'd love to guide you in that process. You just come forward and we begin to sing. We'd love to guide you in that. We're not perfect, nor are you, so we'll work together well along the journey. Maybe you've made a private decision for the Lord, but you've never made it public through baptism. Jesus showed us that example. We'll teach that to you and help you with that if you'll come. And maybe you just got stuffed. Maybe the shield ain't been held high enough or 
Maybe you've dropped it along the way and the darts are eating you alive. You, these steps are a makeshift altar. You can come before the Lord during this time. Don't worry about anybody else. Quit t thinking about everybody else. Just you and God. You just do what God tells you to do. Obey him today. You honor him, he'll bless you. Heavenly Father, I love you, and I thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray that you'll help us to live what you teach us, O oh God, and respond today in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand together, we're going to sing. As we sing, you obey God as he speaks to your heart and life. Morning is his name is wonderful. Let's sing it together.